So today we're going to be continuing in our series in the book of Mark. And um, chapter 12, we've been in chapter 12 for a couple of weeks, but chapter 12 is just so packed with really good stuff. And um, a lot of that has come out because Jesus was being um, basically quizzed and interrogated by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this is just shortly before Jesus would actually go to the cross. And so these Pharisees, Sadducees, and followers of Herod, Herodians, uh, they've been trap trying to trap Jesus into saying something that would discredit him. And after answering, we come to the section now, after answering questions from the Sadducees, Jesus um, silenced them. He answered them with great wisdom. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were uh, opposing um, groups of religious people in Jewish society at that time. They had schools of thought. Now, so the Sadducees, they failed at, uh, at discrediting Jesus. So this Pharisee, uh, one of the teachers of the law, who had been listening to the debate with the Sadducees that was taking place, he approached Jesus. And this particular teacher, he represented the group of Pharisees that they got together and he was appointed to be a spokesperson for them. And this particular teacher represented all of the Pharisees that were there, but this particular teacher's heart was curious. He wanted to uh, test Jesus to see what he knew, but he was really curious with what Jesus would have to say. And I don't think that was the case with all of the people that were putting him to the test here, but our text this morning is Mark 12, 28 to 34. And we're going to start by reading verses 28 to 31. Mark 12, 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment that is greater than these. So with this question that the Pharisee was asking. He wanted to see if Jesus knew the law. And I think the group of Pharisees wanted to see if Jesus would show some disrespect or neglect of some area of the law. But instead of promoting one command over another and categorizing them, Jesus defines the law in its full essence. Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's three gospels and or four gospels and, and three three gospels which give narrative on on everything. In Matthew chapter twenty two, verse forty. Matthew provides some further clarity to what Jesus was saying here. He, he adds, all of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So in context with this same scene here, Matthew's perspective in 2240, he says that all of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, the answer that Jesus get, gave to love God wholeheartedly with 
all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, this command is actually from the Old Testament. It's rooted in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy. And the command, the second greatest command, to love your neighbor as yourself, this is given in uh, the book of Leviticus. So in the Old Testament, just after the Ten Commandments were given to the people of Israel by God on Mount Sinai, Moses had come down with the Ten Commandments. And right after he had given them the Ten Commandments, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, Moses expresses the basis of the law that he had just given them and the things that he was going to tell them further to this that we see in the first five books of the Bible. And Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. The second commandment that Jesus spoke of as being most important was given in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And that verse states, it's a law, a command of God. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So Jesus refers back into the Old Testament to these two great commands. The two most important commands given by God to humanity. And these are the key commandments to all things that are righteous. Everything righteous in the law or decree, decrees that God has made comes down to the foundational principle of loving God and loving other people with our entire being. And because this is such a, it's such an important principle for us to grasp, my prayer is this morning that we would ask the Lord as we're going through this, what do these commandments really mean? What do they mean? What does it mean to love the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength? Question comes, do we really even have the ability to love him like this or to love other people like this? To answer this question, we need to start back at when God created us. When God created people, he created people in his own image. He created us in his own image. He created man in his own image. And the Bible teaches that human beings are not just a physical shell and a personality. The Bible teaches that we consist of body, soul, and spirit. For example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it is written to us, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our text in Mark here, the setting is that Jesus is telling these religious leaders. Now, they represent religion. And I, I think when we look at it, we could say that they represent religion in the world. Jesus tells these guys that according to God, 
The most important thing in life is to have a wholeness in love for God and others. Our, you know, our material bodies are evident, but our, our spirits and our souls are less distinguishable. And sometimes I think we have a difficult time distinguishing between soul and spirit. But the word of God, it says, is like a sword that pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and intents of the heart. Abundant life is given in the communion of the Holy Spirit to the human heart. This is God's gift to us. And this is why the law instructs the Israelites in the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that God's desire was that the Ten Commandments be written on their hearts. You notice how he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. But he says, these laws are to be written upon your hearts. This is an important principle for us to understand because the key to loving God and to loving anyone else the way that God would love have, have us to love them is to have the commands of God written upon the tablets of our heart. It's our heart that God fills with his love, joy, peace, and hope. It's our heart in which he dwells. The heart or the spirit is that which differentiates human beings with the animal kingdom. Now, bear with me. I'm going to mention a couple of Greek words. Just two, two Greek words. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And it refers to that part of man that connects and communes with God. It's the part of us that has intuition when we pray. And, and, we, and we hear the voice of God inside of us. That's, that's pneuma. That's the spirit. Our spirit differs from our soul because our spirit is always pointed towards and exists exclusively for God. Whereas our body and our soul, they're self-centered. The joy, comfort, and peace of God's presence can only be experienced through the spirit. And this is why when we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, our spirit, which is dead to God because of sin, becomes alive to him. We're redeemed when we come to submit our lives to Jesus Christ. We are redeemed from death and reconciled to God. We're born again. And this is what Jesus meant when he told the Pharisee Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. That passage in John 3 says this, John 3, 5 to 7. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. See, the greatest command to love God with all of our heart, with all our spirit, this is the star starting point for loving God with all of our soul and all of our strength. There's a difference between the spirits that we have and the soul that we have. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And the word for soul it's not pneuma, but is shuka. Shuka. Funny word, eh? Not referring to putting shoes on a cow or getting a cow back into its pasture, shuka. You know, it's not like that, right? But Greek, it's talking about a person's mind your will or desires, and your emotional responses to life situations. Your pet has the same kind of experience in the world. They respond with their will, their mind, and their emotions. See, 
So the animal part of us is our soul. And um, our living soul is reflected in our personality. The spirit is different. This is what makes us in the image of God, which is different than your dog or your cat. That's why they don't have dog church or cat church. <laughs> right? Because they, they respond to, to their creator in a different way than we do. We have the intuition and the relationship that we can have with our creator in that spiritual way. So, when a person is alienated from God and is spiritually dead to him because of their sins, that deadness in spirit actually translates to the life of the soul. And the seed of the soul is the mind. And you'll notice in Mark, Jesus talks about soul and mind. Well, the, the seed of the soul is the mind. So when you're dead in your spirit, there's a translation of hostility towards God's way of doing things. There's a, an inner rebel that thwarts us from experiencing the love of God and from being able to love him. The life that is not controlled by the spirit is hostile to God. It cannot submit to God's law. It just can't. I can try all I want to make my soul obey the law of God. And it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. And I kind of like, liken it into uh, a horse, a carriage, and a rider in the carriage. See? It's kind of like the carriage is the physical body that we have. And the horse is our, is our soul. And the driver is the spirit. Okay? What happens to a horse in a carriage that has no driver? Does a horse go where you want it to go? Does a horse follow the path? Maybe sometimes. But that horse, without someone steering it, is going to go whatever direction it wants to go. That's like you as a person when your soul is in charge. It's like a horse in a carriage without a driver. Your soul just goes what, the way that it wants to go. And this is why the Bible talks about, it, about there being a way that is right into a man but it leads into death therein. That's in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 14. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. While everyone's soul is, is uh, living and active, not everyone's spirit is alive or active. Paul writes to this principle in Romans 5, probably Romans 8, 5 to 9. Where he writes this, he writes this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God is within you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So if someone's riding around in the carriage and the horse is just towing the carriage wherever the horse jolly well pleases it to go, they're, they're going on their own. And they don't have the Spirit. They don't have the Lord as the one who speaks and they listen and they follow. The Lord isn't guiding them. And God is aware that we're not capable of living in the realm of the Holy Spirit on our own. You are not. You can try to obey the Ten Commandments. You can try to be righteous on your own. But you can't do it 
before salvation, our sins, our, our rebellious nature separates us from God. And there's this natural hostility that we harbor in our soul towards God. Our mind is twisted by sin. And this is why when you look out in the world and you see all of the troubles that are going on out there, it's because there's all these horses and carts running around without any drivers. It's mayhem. Like, it's not, it's not even... We all know this. People are trying to do the right things. You can elect the right person, or so you think. You know, you can put, put your trust in the governments of men. You can put your trust in your money or, or in the things of this world. But in the end, it's not leading you in the right direction if you don't have the control of God. And this is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had this problem. They were approaching the law specifically with their mind. Specifically with their mind. They were approaching it from a soul perspective. And they weren't able to translate this into what God said in Deuteronomy in the first place. I want these laws to be written on your heart. They couldn't do it because they're approaching it specifically just with their intellect. Now, there's nothing wrong, wrong with loving God with your intellect, right? You're allowed to love God with your, your heart, your soul, and your, your, your faculties and your, and your mind. You know, everything that you are physically. You're to love God in all ways. But that's not the primary. The primary has to come first. The primary has to be a heart, a spirit that is yielded to God. That's where God's um, healing takes place. James chapter 1, 14 and 15 says this. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So there's a progression. There's a progression with sin but there is also a progression with salvation to undo the path of sin. This is so important for us as Christians to understand. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. But the bottom line is, you know, we, love, we want to love God. We've got to keep his commands. But we cannot love God with our whole being like Moses instructed the Israelites in a fallen state without first being regenerated in the spirit. Offering such love to God by ourselves is an impossibility. It's impossible. And that's why they were failing as Pharisees and Sadducees to see that God in the flesh was standing before them because they were thinking about how things should go in their mind and they weren't connected to the spirit. Outwardly, they were very polished. They were wearing the robes. They had the respect of the people. They were the religious leaders of the society. But they're, they're trying to do it on the outward. They're so full of decay and unholiness on the inward because the natural bent of man is hostility to the Spirit of God. And we're no different. We're no different. The same spirit of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that was resisting Jesus is the same spirit alive and well today in the heart that is unsurrendered to God. It's hostile to God and not able to see the truth or even to, to come to the knowledge of the truth. We need to realize this. And this is where the miracle starts. Okay, If you want to love God, you must understand this important principle. In 1 John 4.19, we love God. We love because he first loved us. See, you can't pull yourself to love God. You have to recognize that you're incapable of doing that in yourself and yield to your spirit, yield your spirit to the Holy Spirit. And when God fills you, you love him because he first loved you. He fills you. And then in turn, you are able 
to love him. And you are, an a, you are able to love other people. We get this confused. He loved us first. We need to be infused in his love. To infuse means to fill, to pervade, or even to soak. We're being soaked with the love of God when we come to him and we humble ourselves before him and we say, Jesus, take the wheel of my life. You guys have heard that song. and They sing it in kind of like a good vocal thing. It's not what it's all about. It's a heart thing. Yes, we speak it, but it has to come from the heart. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of words. That's why people can sing Amazing Grace, but be totally lost. Jesus, I want you to take my wheel. I want you to be the driver of the cart and steer my horse in the right direction. Because my horse wants to gallop off on its own. So what do we do? <laughs> what do we do? Sin has clouded our vision. And if you, you're hearing this for the first time and you have never really understand the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want you to know today there is hope. This is not a sermon of discouragement where there is no answer. There is an answer to this because your heart outside of God is veiled by sin. In other words, it's like a big curtain that separates you and God. And the veil was like the curtain in the ancient Jewish temple. Uh, the temple, the second temple, the first temple, they had this veil separating the most holy place from the rest of the temple. And that, that veil separated people from God. People couldn't cross that curtain because of the holiness of God. They couldn't do it. But when Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross, when he died, the very moment of his death, the Bible says that the curtain in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. And this is significant because it means that because in the past, there was no access except through certain process with a high priest involved, a human high priest that wasn't God. And that would only happen once a year. Everyone else on the outside of the curtain. But once, see, when Jesus died, the curtain was torn. Jesus now becomes our sacrifice, and he also becomes our great high priest. So he is God, he is Savior, he is King, he is priest, he is all. And you can access the very throne room of God now because of what Jesus has done. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, he takes your sin, and casts it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. He cleans you out to prepare a place for his Holy Spirit to dwell. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? God designed it this way. If you're a believer and you believe in Jesus, you are not your own. You're purchased with a price. The Spirit of the living God dwells inside of you. Yeah. So you got someone that's on the cart, steering. So don't be like a stubborn horse that pulls against the bit. Yield to the Spirit and let him steer you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. See, those Pharisees, they had a veil across their heart. They couldn't see. The Sadducees couldn't see. They couldn't see. People today that try to approach God from a soul perspective. They can't seek. You can read the Bible all you want. And unless you open your heart to the Spirit's voice, the word without the Spirit is dead. But the word with the Spirit is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, when the veil was there, 2 Corinthians 3, 15 and 16 says, even to this day, when Moses is read, we're talking about the law, right? A veil covers their hearts. Whoever's reading the law just from this perspective right here. 
A veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, in other words, opening their heart, their spirit to Jesus, right? The veil is taken away. And what does that mean? It means there is now access to the throne room of God. You are a child of God. There is access into his presence. He's with you. He's in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God has made this possible by the blood of Christ, by the sacrifice of Jesus. I've heard so many people say, I can't, I can't live as a Christian. Uh, and I've heard this so many times. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I can't live as a Christian. I'm not good enough. I might, not, might as well not even try. Well, the truth of the matter is, you're right. You're not good enough. And you might as well not even try to do it on your own strength. Because you're not going to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. You try to love God with only your mind, without having the spiritual connection, you're going to be just like a Pharisee and a Sadducee. All of us. All of us are in the same. All of us are alike under sin. There is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3, 10 to 24. Romans 3, 10 and 11. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. <laughs> That's the nature of humans. Unless we come to the one who first loved us, and there's a transformation that occurs. There's hope. The good news this morning is that our spirit can turn to God. The Lord Jesus can take away our sin. And by praying to him, calling on his name, confessing our sin to him, turning away from our old way of living, recognizing it as the empty existence that it is, we can come to believe in him. We can come to salvation in him. We can come to life in our spirit. Once we've done this, the veil will be removed. And you will have access to the very throne room of God. And if, if you're here today and you've never made that commitment, I encourage you to do this. Don't delay any longer. If you're hearing on the internet this message, submit your life to Jesus Christ. He will change your life. He will clean you out. And he'll fill you with his Holy Spirit. And you will be a new creation. You will be born again. And Christian, today, recognize who's on the, on the cart, driving, and yield. Learn. You know, horses sometimes can be tamed. Right? Sometimes they're in the process of being tamed. I, I rode an Arabian horse once when I was about 10 years old. And this horse had a mind of its own. And he knew that I was just a kid and I didn't have control. And he wasn't going to yield control to me. Didn't matter what I did, that horse ran. And he ran for a solid two kilometers. I miraculously made it back without getting thrown. But it was a wild west ride, I'll tell you. As a 10 year old, I'm like, ooh, and I wasn't a real good horse rider. But what I'm saying here is, yield to the Spirit. Yield to the, yield to the steering of God. And how does this tie in with loving your neighbor as yourself? Hey, when the Spirit of God lives within you, and he's controlling the wheelhouse, he's controlling the, the reins, and you're yielding to him, he's going to lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You're going to be able to love like no other Love and purity of, of motivation. <laughs> love in accordance with what it's written in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13. You are going to be that person. Why? Because it's not a matter of willing yourself to be that. It's, be, it's an out, outflow of what's happened inside of you. A regeneration that's happened inside of you. The spirit of God living inside of you. Where you begin to think like God thinks. You begin to act like God acts. You go where God wants you to go. You speak to the people that God puts in front of you to speak to. And you love in the manner that Jesus desires. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
how does this affect us in the world? Well, rather than being self-centered, we become God-centered. And being God-centered means we take on the very nature of the ultimate servant, and that is Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, that at the name of Jesus every name in heaven and earth and under the earth shall proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. And Mark wraps it. This chapter right here, this Pharisee that was asking this question inquisitively. He saw what Jesus said, and he thought, wow, there's something here. Maybe something that I need to explore, or that I need to consider. Well said, teacher, the man replied in verse 32. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you, you, Mr. Pharisee, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then, no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus nailed it. <laughs> and I pray that inside your heart today that Jesus helps you to nail this down as well and to understand how it all works. This is the most important thing, the most important 